Eternal Father, is thankful for you bringing us all here under this roof and all that you want to speak to us today. Let everything that is said be true and noble and trustworthy and let it be for your glory. Let our hearts be stirred up to worship you, to know what you are speaking and let our hearts really burn because your voice is speaking to us. Open our understanding, O oh God, to know that it is you who want to deposit something in us. And may we take that back and apply it to our lives. Come Holy Spirit and do your work in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Now there's two letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, that the Apostle Paul wrote. And it seems like he may have written them just a few months apart from each other. Okay. And uh, the video said it's probably the first of his letters, right? And there are a lot of scholars who debate whether it was the first, whether he wrote first Thessalonians first or whether he wrote the letter to the Galatians first. It's a little confusing, even I'm a little confused. But either way, the New Testament started with these letters, either with Galatians or with first Thessalonians. But you've got to realize that the New Testament, the entirety of the second part of the Bible started with this letter. It didn't start with the Gospels. The Gospels came later. But it started with Paul taking this letter and writing it to people in a place called Thessalonica. It's probably the easiest of Paul's letters to understand, which is why we're doing it first. And Paul starts writing harder and harder letters to the point that even the Apostle Peter says, I know his words are hard to understand. Okay, but let's start with the easy stuff. They deal with some straightforward issues. They're written by the same people. It says, Paul, Silas and Timothy. And so it's being written by three people, but it seems that Paul gave all the words and it seems to be Paul's thinking that's there. And so these three were a team that came to Thessalonica. They planted a church there and so he's writing on behalf of them. And both the letters, 1st Thessalonians and 2nd Thessalonians, deal with the same subjects. They deal with the same set of issues. The difference is the tone. In the first letter, he's very nice and casual and chill. In the second letter, he starts getting angry. And we'll see that when we get to that. And we're going to explore the question, why? First thing that we need to realize is Thessalonica was a very important town. It was a place, it was an important trading uh, route. And if you could get something, there, if you could get a business started there, it could spread across. I don't know what the equivalent of that here is, but if you could get some business started there, it would flourish. And you could get it across to many other places. And so Paul, being the smart guy he is, decided, if I get the kingdom of God there, who knows what may happen. And so he decides to go there and spread the word and decided to establish a branch of the church there. And so he moved from Philippi to Thessalonica. Now, this may have been his second journey. He finished one missionary journey and then he starts his second one. I don't know if you remember when we did Acts, we did how the Holy Spirit guides us. How many of you remember that? We did the chart. I drew it. Yeah. Okay. Good job, Zoe. Thank you. One person raised a hand. But he started from Galatia. And it says that he tried to go to Bithynia and he writes the Holy Spirit didn't let them go. And so he moves on to another place called Asia and the Holy Spirit says, no, don't go there either. And so he's just constantly moving and the Holy Spirit saying, no, 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 no. Finally, he says, okay, fine, I'll just go to a place called uh, Troas, I think, the port. And which is where he gets a dream of somebody across the sea from Macedonia saying, come to us. And so he gets on a ship, goes to Macedonia. And so the Holy Spirit is guiding the Apostle Paul. And so he crosses to Macedonia and reaches a port called Neapolis. Doesn't stop there because the first bit of Macedonia that he comes to later on is Philippi. And he, that's where we get the letter to the Philippians from. But he works in Philippi for a bit. But as soon as he could, he moved on. Actually, he was thrown out of Philippi. And he moves to a town called Thessalonica from there. And so that's how he comes there. What was Paul's practice, his main method of preaching the gospel? How did he start? How did he start? Where did he go first? Uh, no, not lecture halls first. Synagogues first. Remember, Paul's first burden was his own people, the Jews. He would always go after them first. He would go to a synagogue and start preaching. They would kick him out and that's when he would go to a lecture hall. But his burden was always for his first people. Uh, for, first for his people. And so he'd go into a synagogue and start preaching for a couple of weeks and the Jews started hating him for it. Like he would last like two weeks, two Sabbaths there and... But when he preached, the key group of people that he, whose hearts he would really touch were a group of people in every city called God-fearers. In our Bibles, it's translated as people who feared God. 
but it's actually a term called God fearers. We did this last time. It's people who were interested in the Jewish religion, but weren't all the way in. They were just people who feared God. They were prob- they were thinking of converting to Judaism. But these were the people who Paul, these were the people whose hearts Paul would touch the most. Because he's coming and saying, the Jewish God has sent his son, Jesus the Messiah, to die on the cross for you, and now you can have faith in him and live a life of freedom. Right? Of course, this pissed off the Jews a lot, and he would get thrown out of the synagogue soon. Simple reason being that he's telling the God fearers, you don't need to do anything to accept, receive God's favor now. He's telling them, Jesus has fulfilled the law, so you don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to kill a lamb anymore. You don't need to, what else is there? Not eat kosher food only. You can eat a cheeseburger, which is against Jewish law, by the way. Right? You can turn on a light switch on Saturday. That's what Paul is saying, and the Jews are annoyed. Because these Jews have spent their whole lives raising up lambs and doing all kinds of things to get God's favor and suddenly Paul is saying none of that. I'd be annoyed because I put in a lot of work. And then Paul is saying you don't need any of that work. And so he'd have to move out of the synagogue and so he'd start preaching in lecture halls. And soon he left a church behind. He did a good job in Thessalonica. He left a church behind but the Jews were so annoyed that they came out of the synagogues and started persecuting him there. They stirred up civil riot against Paul's friends. And Paul's friends had to write a bond to the government saying, we'll we'll move him out of the city. Actually, I think Paul himself moved out of the city so that his friends wouldn't get in trouble. But Paul had to leave the city and run. And he goes to a place called Beria. All this is in the book of Acts, by the way. And this is something we should know. But he goes to a place called Beria for a short period of time but leaves a solid church there. But while he's heading to Beria, he leaves Silas and Timothy behind in Thessalonica. And he's off to Beria. He gets into real trouble at Beria and he's forced to leave there and he's now traveling alone. He gets to a place called Athens and we covered this last time when he went into a non-Jewish place like Athens, he preached from their poets and he said, I'm here to tell you about the God that you don't know. And he starts preaching and gives a public speech about a crucified Messiah and about the bodily resurrection and he gets laughed at. Because to the Greeks, bodily resurrection is ridiculous. They can only think in terms of body bad, spirit good. And Paul is saying, no, your body will be good one day. And then he got severely laughed at. And he may have had a few converts, but he just left that place and moved on to a place called Corinth. Where the spirit of Jesus tells him, wait here, you will be fine. And so he spends a long time working at Corinth. But you've got to understand his mental state by this point. He's got to be really upset. He's got to be severely demoralized. In Philippi, he'd been jailed. And an earthquake had kind of set him free. Then he went to Thessalonica, trouble. Then he goes to Beria, trouble. Then he goes to Athens and he gets laughed at. And finally he's in Corinth and he's trying to set up a church. And we can think of Paul as the greatest missionary of all time, but this guy is a mess by this point. He's seen failure after failure after failure. And he may be super upset by this point. It's probably the toughest time in Paul's ministry. And you've got to understand who's he traveling with. But who who was he traveling with before? Silas and Timothy. Who did he travel with on his first missionary journey? Barnabas. Barnabas Barnabas means what? He doesn't have an encourager with him anymore. He's all alone. He had a fight with Barnabas. It was his fault. Not Barnabas' fault. But he doesn't have his encouraging best friend with him anymore. And he's all alone and he's super depressed. And this comes out in his first letter to Corinth. He says in the letter to Corinth, When I first came to you, I came fully broken. I came so upset. I came carrying nothing and absolutely demoralized. And so at this point, he's very demoralized and depressed. But he's there in Corinth and by this time, Timothy and Silas catch up with him. And they say, guess what? You know that church you left behind in Thessalonica? They're awesome. They're pretty good. You don't need to worry about them. They're a solid church. Right? And he's telling them good news. And so he's really happy about it. Timothy and Silas are telling, the, are telling Paul they've received the word and there's nothing for him to worry about. And that really lifts up Paul's spirits. Right? And so Paul is in Corinth and he gets good news. And he also gets news that there are some issues in Thessalonica. Nothing major to worry about. When we do, He's in Corinth right now where there are major issues. We'll get to that when we do the letter to the Corinthians. But... Paul and uh, Timothy and Silas say that no major issues to worry about in Thessalonica, but you need to deal with them anyway. And so Paul, remember, he, Jesus has told him, stay in Corinth. And so Paul is saying, okay, I can't go back. 
here's what I'll do. I'll write letters. And so you all go give it back. And let's see what happens. And so he writes them a letter. And that's how the New Testament begins, unless Galatians was written before that. The other good news that he received was Paul and Silas and Timothy came to him from Thessalonica with money. Now remember, Paul was a tent maker. He worked. He worked hard. And then eventually he met this couple who, had, who were also persecuted, whose names were Priscilla and Aquila, who were also tent makers. So the three of them sat on the road and built tents all day, made money, used that money to spread the gospel. And now finally, Silas and Timothy have come to him saying, here's some offering from Thessalonica. And so Paul goes, okay, now that we have a little money, I can stop with the tents for a bit and focus more on the preaching. And so there's good news after good news and he's a little happy and he wants to send a thank you note also. And so that's where chapter one begins. It's a warm letter. It starts with, I'm thankful to God for you. And we just heard chapter one being read. And there are some things that I want to highlight from chapter one. He highlights a couple of triplets. Okay, he, he highlights how the Thessalonians received the gospel in word, deed, and sign. Right? Paul gave the gospel this way. He never went and just preached. He showed it with his life and he demonstrated it with wonders. This is how Paul communicated the gospel. Unfortunately, it's not the way many of us communicate the gospel. And a lot of us try and focus on the word if we try communicating the gospel. But there's also living our lives according to the gospel. And there's also demonstrating the power that comes with the gospel. See, there are people who don't just want to hear the gospel, they need to see it. That's what Paul recognized. He knew that people were waiting to see the gospel in front of them. Word, deed and sign. Two for the eyes. One for the years. Remember when Jesus said, when Jesus sent out his disciples two by two, he said, it's going to be really easy for you guys to preach the gospel. All you need to do is go out, heal the lepers, raise the dead, cure the sick, cast out demons, and say the kingdom of God has come on you. And I wish we still did that. But they could demonstrate the gospel in power, and Paul was doing that. Right? And so there's word, deed, and sign, which is something we need to keep in mind. The next triplet is, he says, the result was your faith, hope, and love. In 1 Corinthians also, he says, faith, hope, and love. And Paul is constantly saying that we need to have faith, hope, and love. Because it is easy to lack in these. For example, the Thessalonians had great faith and love. But they were really struggling with hope. And we see that play out in the later chapters. But they were struggling in their hope. And but Paul, Paul can say, you guys are excellent in your love and faith and that's awesome. And so we need to be a church that is strong in faith, hope and love. And then he mentions the Trinity in the first chapter. He says, God, Jesus and the Spirit. And so he demonstrates how Christianity is Trinitarian. There's always Father, Son and Spirit involved, actively working in us. And the final triplet is, he says, you turn from idols to the living God, to serve the living God and to wait for his Son. You turned from your old way of life to serve the living God and now we live in hope waiting for the sun to return. That's what he says about them. He speaks about their repentance and service and now waiting. It seems like Paul is making a case for his own integrity in this whole chapter. Like in the beginning he's saying, I didn't do this, I didn't do this, I didn't try flattery, I didn't take money from you. That's what he's saying. And it seems like these Jews who had been so jealous of him were spreading lies about him. They were spreading rumors about him. And that's what the devil does. The devil tries to attack our work by spreading false motives about us. That we have a hidden agenda. The devil is the father of lies. And his work has been the same. And that's how he tries to undo, undo the work. So the first thing he... So the first thing the Jews are doing is imputing bad motives to Paul and start spreading lies about him. So let me ask you this. Now that we have the answer in this, what do you think the bad rumors were based on what you just read? There are a lot of them. So if you can, shout out one or two. One is like, he's abandoned you, doesn't even care about He's abandoned you, yeah. He doesn't, Paul doesn't care about you. That he was weird with money, yeah. He embezzled money, that's another rumor. He didn't speak from God, yeah? For his own, uh, yeah, for his own power, yeah? Any more? 
Awesome, but these are good. This is how we need to think when we read it. Like what is happening? Why is Paul writing these things? And it helps us understand what was going on at that time and it helps us know how we can read it for that context. So here are some of the rumors that he was ineffective. He had to leave the situation in Thessalonia, Thessalonica in confusion. And so Paul's defense to that is, it wasn't ineffective. Look at you, you are a solid church full of faith and love. Then they blame him of being a coward. He left Thessalonica because he was a criminal, they say. And here Paul is saying, out of his boldness, I was jailed in Philippi and yet I came to Thessalonica. They say he was mentally unbalanced and Paul is saying, I mean what I say. That he was a trickster, like you said, using people for his own advantage. And his defense is humility. He's saying, I'm humble and I didn't choose to stand on my rights. That he was a flatterer and his defense is, I've been gentle, I treat you, I treated you like a nurse treats a baby. And the rumor was that he was an opportunist, that he was preaching only for money. And he reminds them that he didn't take their money at all. You know, it, it's weird. The rumors here is that he, di- he took money and that's why he's a false teacher. When we come to the letter of Corinthians, the accusation will be he didn't take money, so he must be a false teacher. <laughs> that he doesn't even trust in the effectiveness of his work to take money. And so it's important to realize the context in each place. And here, the rumor is that he takes money, that he doesn't work and he had an easy life. And here Paul is saying, I build tents and I'm busy all the time. I've worked from dawn till dusk every day. And so these are the rumors he's trying to combat and give them the truth. And the problem continues today where the devil uses criticism to undermine our work, especially when it comes to making the church suspicious of its leaders. It's important to question our leaders, but it's also important to recognize why we're doing it. Like, we're not under the authority of leaders to a certain point we are, but we're all under the authority of the world. And so are the leaders. And so we get to have conversations. We get to have differences. But we don't get to undermine motives needlessly. And we've got to... Paul actually writes uh, at a certain place, we're not unaware of the devil's schemes. And we've constantly got to ask, how is the enemy? how may the enemy be trying to split the church? Because see, every time the enemy has tried to attack the church from outside, the church has only gotten stronger. And so the easiest, most effective way to destroy it is from the inside. That's always been the way. That's always been his tactic. And it's led to a lot of suffering for people like Paul. And Paul is still able to say suffering is a normal part of the Christian life. And he's trying to tell the Thessalonians, even if you suffer, it's, it's what we are meant for. It's what, how God is shaping us and leading us. And Paul is not surprised that he has to suffer. For him, suffering is a proof of election and a seal of faith. And he's almost to the point of saying the people who don't suffer, they're the ones who should be really worried. Right? In fact, I think in Corinthians, I don't know why I'm speaking about Corinthians so much, but he again gives a general promise which says, I think that was in First Timothy, anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now that's a, pretty much a promise. There's a good one for you. There's a sticker to put on our laptops. But that's what Paul is saying. And he's willing to preach the truth. But it's still coming from a place of happiness that all my work has not been in vain. There's a solid church left behind and I'm happy about it. So now you get the idea of why he's writing Thessalonians. Right? Father, we thank you for your word and thank you that you've brought us together and you are revealing to us the truth that's in your word. Help us to recognize your presence and how you want us to be shaped by the way you speak to us. Bless us as we split into groups and discuss and help us to really recognize your heart and build each other up, encourage each other up and fill us with your spirit that we may show faith, hope and love in all that we do. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Amen.